We'll call the meeting of Environment Natural Resources Policy to order. Representative Green, have you reviewed the minutes of March 20th? Yes, I have. I'll move the minutes. Uh, in favor of the minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Green. <laughs> First uh, bill we have today on the uh, agenda is going to be the uh, Fisher uh, House File 683, and we'll bring that bill be recommended to pass and re referred to the Committee on Rules. And Representative Fisher, you have an amendment, the DE1 amendment? Yes, I'd like to have the DE1 amendment moved to. Uh, it helps clean up the language so we can follow it much easier. Okay. And so, members, this amendment reflects the amendments that were previously adopted in the committee. And so, Representative Fisher, this was at the past meeting, this amendment, DE, uh, adopts, uh, reflects all of those. So, Representative Fisher moves the DE1 amendment be uh, amended to uh, House File 683. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Uh, Representative Fisher, to your bill. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, we had quite a discussion at our last meeting on this uh, on this bill. There were a number of concerns that were brought up, and some of the concerns that brought up involved where uh, people had questions where current groundwater management areas might be. Um, and so we did a bit of work trying to find out where those were to try to address some questions. And um, it appears to me that with the information I've been able to find that uh, currently the state of Minnesota through the DNR has not identified any water management areas at all in the state. Um, I do know that I received a uh, copy uh, earlier today, an uh, email that had groundwater areas of concern outlined in it. Um, and I think that was emailed out to most of the people, uh, to most of the committee members here. And as I looked at the groundwater areas of concern, this is not something that is outlined in statute. And one of the things is I looked at this map of uh, groundwater areas of concern that uh, uh, kind of concerned me a little bit is I know that they've had issues down at, in the city of Worthington, and that area doesn't even show up on this map. And uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm just at a loss, as I was expecting to be able to have a bill to come through to um, you know, give us tools to start addressing uh, groundwater sustainability. And I find out that right now, through the DNR, they don't have any areas that are currently established. Um, and I know that's critical for some of our members here to find out how that's going to apply. And I had talked to Representative uh, Fabian and McNamara earlier, and they had a number of concerns that I was not able to address with the bill that I have right now. And as much as it kills me to say this, I would recommend that instead of moving forward, we lay this on the table until we can get some more answers out of the DNR as to where areas of uh, uh, sustainability, uh, water management areas are. I'm, um, I'm, I'm just very frustrated by what I've found out so far. Well, thank you, Representative Fisher, and I don't think you want to lay the bill on the table, just lay the bill over. Okay. Let's have just some discussion. I'm, I'm kind of taken back by all of this, uh, particularly when I looked at the map. Uh, I thought when I first, I just glanced at the map, to be honest with you, earlier today, and I saw the, I saw the little circles on the map. It was sent by email today. And, in fact, Representative Fisher, why don't you pass that around? I think you'll quickly get the idea. And it says on it, uh, areas of concern. Well, I just assumed that those were the sustainability areas. Well, then I realized that Worthington isn't even on there. I mean, we've heard a big hubbub on this in this committee about Worthington and the businesses and this, that, and the other. So, wow, I'm really lost on this. So maybe somebody from the DNR, Mr. Hirsch, if you could come up and, and kind of help us along here. I, I, I'm, I'm not thinking this bill is moving at all today. But, I mean, suddenly, I mean, I feel like I don't have any information, let alone some information, particularly when there's sustainability that's de de uh, uh, de uh, defined in, in statute. Mr. Hirsch. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, Steve Hirsch, DNR Ecological and Water Resources. First, first, with respect to the groundwater management areas, it is correct that we have not formally designated any groundwater management areas that we are looking at two areas that we want to try that in, and one was the Park Rapids area near the near the straight river and then the other one is bonanza valley so those are two that we have in mind but we haven't formally designated any yet that's correct uh, with the groundwater areas of concern i'm trying to remember exactly where worthington is on the map but isn't it close to the right on the border to the area where eight is circled there more to the east i believe yeah, the east yeah, so i i can find out why that that area wasn't included on this but I think, in general, I think this map does give you a pretty good idea of where the sustainability issues are. So, and then, uh, you know, here, yeah. Well, no, I don't think that, personally, I don't think that it, 
the eight catches Worthington, but I could stand corrected on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you're correct that uh, Mr. Meyer just showed me the map, so it's a little bit to the east. Yeah. So um, is there any idea, uh, Representative Fisher or Mr. Hirsch, is there any idea when some of these critical areas, I mean, like White Bear Lake, I think we've heard just voluminous information about the White Bear Lake community and shipping water to other communities and the water lake level going down and a variety of different testimony here. When is the DNR going to know these things? And I just all of a sudden feel like we don't have any information. Well, Mr. Chairman, with regard to White Bear Lake, I think we've got a growing body of information that's going to help us look at solutions there. And I think that's, you know, certainly one of the issues that, that DNR has been struggling with and that we've talked about is that we do not have enough information to manage our groundwater resources. So we're, you know, we're, in, we're in complete agreement that information is lacking. But, you know, what I would say with regard to groundwater management areas, we do intend to look at those two areas I mentioned. But even in areas where we don't have groundwater management areas, we've resolve that we need to manage groundwater differently than we have in the past and more sustainably. So even if we don't have a groundwater management area, we need to do business differently, particularly in areas where we have sustainability issues. We're not going to be able to designate a groundwater management area in all the areas you see circled here on the state, at least at least not right away. Uh, and, you know, with, re with regard to White Bear Lake and the metro area in general, there are a uh, number of water sustainability issues with uh, groundwater sources in the metro area. And at least our, our initial take on that is that rather than try to designate a groundwater management in that area, that because we've got Metropolitan Council that is, you know, very heavily involved in water supply issues and we've got the local units of government, that the groundwater um, management area model may not be as good for the metropolitan area. It may be more about getting all the necessary partners together and figuring out how we're going to manage groundwater more sustainably. Representative Fisher, would it be something that maybe we should consider here I mean, I think right now the bill, if we lay it over, is destined to be <clears throat> in play next year. I mean, with all due respect, I don't know that we have the information. Should should it be possible that maybe one of the things that we look at between now and the end of this session in May, that we look at defining in statute as sustainability as areas of concern as well? I. I, yeah, I, I think that may be a possibility and 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 the reason I'm um, you know this is all new information that we're hearing across the board um, is one of the things that this bill is going to do is also be able to, to address the big issue out there of the fact that we have uh, small businesses use, using uh, businesses who are small users of water who are using it and not paying anything or permitted at all putting them at an unfair advantage over other businesses we've got private wells many of them in the metropolitan area that are that are in these areas that are critical that are not being permitted or are watched over at all and so there's got, and the way the bill's written right now would not address those kind of concerns. And so somehow we've got to figure out how to come back in and figure out a better way to do it. So I, I think from that aspect, it's going to end up having to take more time to address it. I just don't know how long it's going to take because it's turned out to be much more complicated than anything I had ever envisioned. Representative oh, Thank you. I, I just wanted uh, just to let committee members know sustainability is already defined in statute. So perhaps one of the things we can do at a later date is uh, just Xerox that statute and hand it around. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm amazed. Um, I've been, I'm new here, so bear with me a little bit. Maybe you can help me uh, understand this. I've been listening now for two months that uh, we have uh, this, this groundwater problem, and uh, now you're telling me you don't even know can you can you tell me how much money the DNR has spent on uh, on the research of groundwater to have over the years that we don't even know there's not even a plan out there? Well, Representative Green, uh, that's a really good question, and I can hear that question being answered very readily in Representative Wagenius's committee because that is a finance question. But I think that the policy part of this thing is is like we got to like get some serious traction here. Um, I don't think that Mr. Hirsch is in defense of the DNR, which, anyway, in defense of the DNR, <laughs> I don't know that they're here today to be able to answer that question. It's a very, very good question, but uh, I, I'm, frankly, I'm just totally blown away. In fact, I actually, 
I think if I were trying to pass this bill in my freshman year, I'd be up there at that stand trying to do every possible thing I could get it done to get it passed. And I hear Representative Fisher saying, we don't have the information, so let's deal with it next year. So I appreciate that, Representative Fisher. That's that's uh, a way to some decent legislation, maybe even great legislation. So uh, any other questions? And uh, Rick M. Green, I didn't mean to diminish your question. I just I heard it all finance, what you were asking. And, and I'm certain that Representative McNamara will be answering that, asking that same question at some point in the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Any other questions on the bill? Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Wagenius may be able to help me more with this. But I'm wondering, because there is some urgency to some of this, is there any part of it that makes sense for us to pass now? and then build on and do more next year rather than just letting the whole thing go for another year? Well, I'm going to answer that question. Thank you. Uh, there may well be some parts of this, but we're not going to cure that here in this committee hearing. And just because uh, this bill would be going to rules, the, the original motion, and now what I hear uh, Representative Fisher uh, asking to amend the chair's motion, uh, if there is something in there of value that we could do and make it effective and have a good outcome this year, I'm willing to bring it back to committee again and uh, uh, and then send it to rules from here. So I, I think the answer is possibly yes. That's just something that we, I mean, I went up to the office five minutes before 4 o'clock and had all this dropped on me, and I'm thinking, wow, I thought this was going to be, we're, in fact, I told some folks at lunch we were going to pass this bill today out of here to, rep to uh, the Rules Committee. So, Any other questions? Representative Fabian, and no, it does not affect your area. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to note, Representative Fabian, do you have the map? I do. Well, there's area five up here of groundwater areas of concern that affect taconite mining, hard rock mining. So maybe I didn't even want to pass the bill in the first place. But go ahead, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to you, Representative Fisher, I say uh, thank you and congratulations. You've made a good decision. But I do want to bring up one other thing. Uh, and this kind of crosses both uh, bills that we've been talking about this morning and then also now. Um, <clears throat> I like... Representative Green and Representative McNamara expressed this morning a great deal of frustration. I, I just find this uh, really, really hard to believe that we have this uh, pressing issue, but yet we have minimal data available to us. Uh, it was also mentioned this morning that uh, they were going to be involving the local SWC, or they had been having conversations with the local SWCDs and so forth about the, uh, the plan that uh, Representative Roginius brought forth this morning. I took the liberty of contacting the four SWCDs in my area. They know nothing about this new bill that's being un unveiled today either. And I just find it amazingly disrespectful to local people to be doing something like this and saying one thing and doing something else. That's my comment. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments on this? There being none. It, well, I'm going to ask for anyone like testify for or against the bill. Just if, if someone came to testify for or against the bill. Uh, I think you know the direction the bill's going now. Anybody here? All right, thank you very much. Uh, the bill is uh, laid over. Thank you, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. All right, the next bill uh, before us is House File 1442, uh, as amended and recommended to pass and be re referred to the Rules Committee. And the author has the DE6 amendment. Representative Hansen moves House File 1442 be amended. As amended, be recommended to pass and re-refer to the Rules Committee. Representative Hansen, to your DE6 amendment. Uh, does everyone have the DE6 amendment? Does anyone have any questions on the DE6 amendment? Being none, we'll adopt it to get it in the shape the author would like it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Representative Hansen, 21442 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, the DE6, you can tell it's been a work in progress uh, where we've had multiple versions as we've been working with uh, various interests in the agency on trying to refine this proposal and uh, uh, I think we've got it in a pretty good shape. I'm going to have uh, uh, Mr. Erdman walk through the uh, the bill. Uh, we have uh, we did receive a fiscal note I think in the last 24 hours that was quite high. I know this isn't a fiscal committee but we have made some changes to the bill that will probably require a new fiscal <laughs> note reducing the costs 
and uh, that can be addressed in the ultimate committees uh, that it, it goes to. Mr. Mr. Erdman, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Henry Erdman on behalf of the Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Uh, the thrust of this legislation has been and continues to be to educate people, uh, especially watercraft users, on AIS from both out-of-state and in-state watercraft users. Uh, we've made some significant changes to the legislation, and I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, based on from what was the uh, first engrossment. Number one, we modified the watercraft length and lowered the fees for both in-state and out-of-state. That's on line 1.23. Second, we provide that owners of multiple watercraft will only pay a full fee for a decal on the largest watercraft that they own and a nominal charge for each additional watercraft on line 2.4 for your reference. Number three, we also give owners the option to purchase multiple decals at the point of license renewal. That's the three-year license renewal on the watercraft. That's on line 2.14. Number four, it provides for electronic purchase of decals. This is especially important for out-of-state users who could perhaps buy the temporary decal in another state and then come to Minnesota waters. That's on line 2.27. Uh, fifth, it exempts border waters, and this only applies to inland waters. That was one of the questions that was raised at the committee, so we've just exempted those border waters. That's on line 3.11. Uh, another point, it includes consultation language between the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Transportation regarding the use of way stations for inspection purposes. And then it appropriates uh, some dollar amounts to the Conservation Legacy Partners Program uh, for AIS activities to local units of government and lake associations. We chose the CLP because that's an existing program that seems to work quite well. And that's pretty much the bill, Mr. Chairman. Questions Stand on the questions. bill. Representative Magnum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Erdman, can you? Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Mr. Chair. I knew you were next. I, so I called on you. <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even catch it till both these guys did. Sorry, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Erdman, uh, or Representative Hanson, probably. Excuse me. The repealer again is taking away which sticker and what is that again? The trailer, Mr. Chair, Representative McNamara. That's the trailer sticker, and the idea is we wouldn't have two. We wouldn't have the duplicative stickers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so it would repeal the trailer sticker immediately, and then the short term, uh, the how quick would this boat sticker take place? Would there be some overlap in between there? Mr. Chairman, Representative McNamara, the actual effective date for the trailer that's being repealed in this provision is 2015. Uh, and the provision for this entire bill is actually effective January 1, 2014. So there's really, uh, that's kind of where it stands. Representative Buco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think Rep Representative Hanson. Um, last time we talked about uh, border waters, uh, St. Croix River, uh, possibly up, you know, Namakin and Crane and all of that stuff. Um, did we give any thought in this bill to uh, controlling that, or, or is there a, a reasonable way to do that? Representative Hanson. M Mr. Chair and, and uh, Representative Uglum, uh, since we met last, we asked the agency for some ideas on that, and uh, what you see is the recommendation. That there's no way to do it. <laughs> that, that was their recommendation, is to just exempt them. And I mean, I think... I think we could continue to think about it, but um, we don't want to let the, the exception or the challenge get in the way of our, our effort. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good question, Representative Buchel and Representative Hanson. So a Canadian boat that comes across and is not on a border water, uh, let's say went to Pelican Lake and Orr, which is not a border water, they would have to have the appropriate stickers, correct? Correct. And Mr. if they were on Namican Lake, where we already have Spiny Water Flea, they wouldn't have to have the... the the sticker, is that correct? That's correct. Now, I think you see, uh, Representative Uglum and those, uh, what the complexity is of, of these international waters, particularly our uh, waters that have multiple states on them. So, uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and this question may be for DNR, I'm not sure, but why are, we, why are we phasing out the trailer and putting the sticker on the boat? Um, if, if someone uh, has a boat that sits at their dock, all the time, and all they ever do is pull it out, and they don't literally don't trailer it. Um, why wouldn't we keep the sticker on the trailer instead of putting it on the boat? I don't get this. 
Mr. Erdman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Fabian, it's just that we didn't want to have two competing stickers. I know the appetite for this legislature for decals is low, and we didn't want to have two going at the same time, but I'm sure the agency could clarify. Representative Fabian. Okay. And I understand that, but why, my main question is, is why are we going away from the trailer sticker to a boat sticker? As I understand this legislation, we are phasing out the trailer sticker in 2015. Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, Representative Fabian, actually the, the, the sticker for the trailer is not even effective until 2015. This was put into law a year or two ago with a prospective effective date, so it's not even really actually there until 2015 if we should let that go into effect. So, uh, Representative Hansen, um, a resort operator on Mille Lacs that has 20 boats, 16 foot lines or crest liners or whatever they may be. Tell me about how that's going to work. Uh, you know, if you buy a dealer, if you're a dealer, you can have one dealer plate, you can have it on, uh, <clears throat> you know, multiple boats mm -hmm. at different times. How, how is that going to work? Mr. Chair, I would encourage you and the committee to look on uh, line 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6. A person who owns multiple watercraft may receive additional uh, AIS decals for a fee of $1 for each additional decal. So Thank they you. pay one and then... Yep. Representative Russo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, might shed a little light on the boat versus trailer thing. We uh, in our household have, I believe, a total of five boats, none of which ever ride on a trailer. They ride on top of a car and get carried and portaged and whatnot. And so. Um, possibly that might provide some motivation for that. And, you know, actually, I'm the other way around. I have five boats and only one trailer. Yeah. And, you know, they go from shore, sitting on shore on blocks, into the lake and back out of the lake, back onto blocks in the in the winter time. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, it can be complicated. I mean, I, I know that it's something to think about. Questions? Represent uh, Bugle. Well, Mr. Chair, um, um, so... How do you do that with your airplane then? You put the uh, put the boats on the airplane too then? Well, that's actually, Representative Buchel, and that's a good question because, uh, you know, I've learned that at, up in Voyagers National Park, they've actually banned the use of uh, float plane aircraft on the interior lakes of the Keptokoma Peninsula as well as Macu uh, certainly Little Trout Lake, I believe, and maybe even possibly Makuta. I haven't stayed up that close to it, but uh, I'm suspecting that uh, these uh, things that infest the waters could be transferred off the floats of a float aircraft, you know, I mean, they're not dry inside, and you pump the floats, to, you know, a lot of times before you fly them, I mean, there's an opportunity there, too, and someone actually asked me, who was against this bill, who knows that I have an airplane on floats, wanted to know if I was willing to put a sticker on my aircraft, I said, well, it isn't legal to put it on there, uh, but uh, anyway, you get the point, it's a good question, mm -hmm. how, how uh, there's a lot of ways to spread aquatic invasive species, and I mean, I don't think we've got a bill that covers every single one of them. Representative Hansen. Mr. Chair, you're correct, and I, I didn't think I heard you say you were in favor of banning float planes going into lakes. I, I don't think I heard that, so. I, I, well, Representative Hansen, I actually fought tooth and nail with the park over that, because, uh, but they've also banned all boats on those lakes that I described, except park boats. So now the park puts boats there that they own, and then you reserve and use them rather than allowing canoes, for example, to be taken into those lakes. Not all lakes. I don't remember but on the capital of Peninsula. Certainly. Other questions, Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm wondering if we could hear from the DNR. I'm kind of confused just over the boat sticker and the trailer sticker because we made significant changes last year, and I, I just am wondering how this works with the plan that we put in place. I think it was last year, not two years ago. We had discussion, because originally we used to have a trailer sticker, and it was, I can't remember if it was voluntary or, or, or what, or we, we've gone back and forth, and I'm just wondering where it's at and what the department's position is on this. Mr. Meyer, welcome, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the record. Bob Meyer, Department of Natural Resources. In the, I could probably write a fact sheet on the history of AIS boat decals since the past couple of years, but. We started off with a mandatory sticker um, that was looked like a navigational type sticker. It was about this big that you were required to have in your boat on the first AIS bill that we had that had the AIS laws on there. That then was repealed the following year, 
and we came up with the trailer decal. Uh, and actually, that was the year that we were able to get the increased enforcement, the increased penalties as well. So now the the trailer decal is to require a person to have the same type of decal to place on their trailer. And that, that effective date wasn't until, as Mr. Erdman stated, 2015. Now what we're talking about here is a new, different decal that would be required on all boats using public waters within the state, excluding the border waters. That the, it provides several different opportunities. One is it, it requires a person to understand and read the AIS laws every year. I mean, we've been changing these laws that they're you know, drain your plug, keep your plug out, no moving of water in your minnow buckets, um, cleaning your plant, your your trailer, drying your boat for, you know, three to seven to 21 days, whatever the, the recommendations are at that time. Um, if you have a wake board, a wake boat, you know, you have certain things you need to make sure you're moving water out of those ballast tanks, those ballast floats. It, it becomes very complicated. So. The, the bill, as written, would require a person to understand those rules on a yearly basis. It also provides some funding, increased funding level. And I think one of the bigger things it does is captures non-resident boats coming into the state because it does require them to have a decal as well. And these non-resident users, we, we don't have a good estimate of how many people are bringing their boats, but Representative Dill, I know at your house you probably see hundreds of boats a day going through to Canada primarily, or to Lake of the Woods, but there are a number of boats that travel through the state. Uh, if you look at the, the, the waters in Detroit Lakes, Alexandria, and those, those resorting communities, those lake communities, a number of boats are coming in from out of state to be used in inland waters. So this does require those non-resident users to be familiar with those rules and regulations of the state of Minnesota, and also to capture some kind of money from those boaters to pay for aquatic invasive species management activities. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Does the department support um, the repealer to get rid of the trailer sticker and now go to a boat sticker? Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, we don't see the need to have both of them. If the, We do see the need to have one. Okay, if, if, if this bill passes, yes. If this bill doesn't pass, we want to keep the, the current trailer sticker. A new, way, a new way to say they're neutral. I take that as an endorsement. Um, uh, um, <laughs> Mr. Meyer, um, on page two, uh, line 14, would the department's plan be to some way, it, it looks like I can still buy my three-year watercraft license and then I would buy the stickers for three years for my boat. Would you then, would I do something each year so that I was aware of uh, <laughs> the opportunity of taking the classes? Would uh, you... Would I have to go online or something, or what, what are the thoughts? Or maybe that hasn't been thought out. Maybe, Mr. Erdman, it's maybe not a question for you, Mr. Meyer. Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Representative McNamara, we're working with the author and the stakeholders on this bill, and that is something that I think we, we would need to figure out as this bill moves forward. We, the, the idea here is to provide flexibility, but also we need to make sure that that person is up to date on those current laws and regulations. Okay. Yeah. And, and one question for the author, um, uh, Representative Hansen. I actually am probably the only one over on this side of the table that actually could live with something like this, and I actually kind of advocate for some of these ideas. But where is the resort community? What's your discussion with them? I am concerned about those folks, and uh, as Mr. Meyer alluded to, in the Detroit Lakes area, it's the North Dakota people, Central Minnesota, it's a lot of Iowa people. What, what are the resort saying? Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative McNamara, um, I was first able to uh, meet with Mr. Quillis with the chamber today, and I asked him that very question, uh, and later I did in the elevator uh, see Mr. Carlson, but I was we were on our way to session, so I didn't get to discuss that but I did discuss it with uh, uh, Mr. Quillis with the chamber and uh, I know he's here and he could say I think the same thing he said to me which is we haven't really discussed it yet and I said well we're going to have an amendment today to try to take care of some of those concerns he could not affirmatively since he's standing right behind you but um, Mr. Quillis you want to come down and enlighten us please Mr. Joel Carlson in here? I don't know. No. 
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tony Coolis. I'll be representing Hospitality Minnesota, which is the umbrella organization of the resorts, campgrounds, lodging association, and resorts. Uh, I did have a conversation earlier today. Uh, I have talked previously with Mr. Erdman, and I have had a conversation today with Representative Hansen regarding this bill. The Minnesota Resort and Campground Association understand the importance of addressing the aquatic invasive species um, issue here in this state. It's very important to us to move forward on this. Um, we have talked to Representative Hansen. One of the concerns was for us was how we addressed um, some of the non-residents, and you've had that conversation right now on how we go through and how we enforce that. Um, we had a brief discussion on most of those folks, if they're going to come up fishing, would have to get a non-resident fishing license. So in the process of doing that, that would probably be something that Mr. Meyer and his friends could work on trying to be able to do that. Um, we have not um, gone through and had further discussions on how we would use this money. We had very brief discussions on some of the um, inspection stations, and I notice I haven't seen the A6 yet, but I've seen that there is some language I think that um, has been briefly discussed dealing with DOT and DNR. So um, we're in the process of trying to process it. It is a very important um, issue. Um, it is a yearly deal, so we've had some discussions earlier about, I think um, Representative Johnson talked about how boat licenses in the state are staggered every three years. So if the resort community for some of the larger ones, um, that's usually a concern, but not um, if we're going to talk about a yearly process, uh, yearly sticker right here, Mr. Chair. Questions for Mr. Quillis. Representative Fabian. Uh, I'll, well, Mr. Chair, thank you. It's not necessarily for Mr. Quillis, but it is for the author. So, okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess I'm interested in, uh, in Representative Hanson. Uh, Mr. Quillis alluded to it. Uh, not sure how we're going to spend the money. So we're going to charge people, you know, $5, 10 15 $20 a year. We're going to start a program that does what? <laughs> Representative Hanson. Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, um, I think you're aware that in the past couple of years we've provided one-time money for aquatic invasive species. And uh, there, there are proposals in the governor's budget and supplemental dollars, and we'll be seeing those in the, in the Finance Committee of trying to continue to respond to aquatic invasive species. I would encourage you to look on page 3, uh, section 4 of the appropriation. And the fiscal note, as I mentioned, will be revised. But based on uh, testimony I've heard here and, and also when we're not at the committee, I think there's been concern about the department uh, implementing AIS and the uh, desire among some local units of government to be working on AIS. So what I did here is I took the existing Conservation Partners Legacy Program that we have with legacy dollars. It's an existing... Uh, process for small grants and larger grants, but it follows the grants management process. So we're not creating a new wheel here. But then to have that, to have part of this appropriation go to that uh, so that it could be used for local units of government to try to implement uh, AIS uh, educational items, uh, work with lake associations. So it's not only the DNR that's providing them. But we are going to, we're going to, if we want to continue where we're at, into the into the future, we're going to have to find something besides one-time money. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I think it would be helpful for the entire state of Minnesota if we had some sort of a detailed plan from DNR. This is what we're going to do to get after this problem, and um, we we just seem to be throwing things around and hoping that something sticks. And and I and I realize the importance of battling this stuff, but we really need to come up with a detailed plan. This is how the money's going to be used if we're talking about grant things and empowering local lake associations and so forth. I think those are great ideas, but at some point we need a plan. We're appropriating money. We've done it for the last two years. We're going to do it again this year. Um, but I, I have some reservations about um, how some of this stuff gets done. <coughs> I do have a question for uh, DNR, Mr. Chair, if I may. Which division? Uh, enforcement. Oh, good, because I have a question as well. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Rodman Smith, if you would come up here, please. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Smith, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, on uh, on the first page of the uh, uh, of the bill, uh, at line 1.15, it says attempt to place. 
What is the definition of attempting to place uh, a watercraft? Mr. Chair, for the record, Lieutenant Colonel Rodman Smith, Assistant Director for DNR Enforcement. Mr. Chair, I believe, and, and Representative Fabian, I believe the, the purpose for line 1.15 would be if there was a watercraft inspector or a conservation officer at a landing and somebody was going to back their boat into the access to launch it and they didn't have the sticker, they could not place it or attempt to play or back down and try to get that boat into the water. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Lieutenant Colonel Smith, um, on lines 1.20 and 1.21, it says only the aquatic invasive species decals that is currently valid shall be displayed. So um, let's say that uh, somebody mistakenly puts uh, the two decals side by side and instead of taking the other one off or putting it over the top of that. Is, obviously, that does not follow the law. Um, what's going to be enforcement action taken there? Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, um, that our officers have discretion. They can give somebody a verbal warning. They can give somebody a written warning. And in this, they, they could actually give somebody a ticket. But I believe troopers see this and sheriff's officers see this with uh, license plate tabs where people will stack their tabs around their license plates every once in a while. Uh, I don't foresee this as uh, a major issue, but to, to directly answer your question, it could be a misdemeanor. But we do have other mm -hmm. tools in our tool belt as far as verbal warnings, written warnings. Wow. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, this would be for the author, Representative Hanson. Uh, under this uh, bill, w what are the penalties for various uh, enforcement actions that may be taken against. Representative Hanson. Mr. Chair and, and uh, Representative Fabian, I would encourage you to look at the original uh, bill. We did make a trip to civil law and we took the civil penalties out that were in the bill. So it would be the existing enforcement authority of the commissioner. And Mr. Smith could describe that. We are not assigning any additional authority or civil penalties. We stripped those from the bill earlier. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Fabian, uh, everything under 86B, there's a catch-all statute that makes any violation 86B a misdemeanor unless otherwise specifically uh, directed, uh, something to that effect. But it's the language, but it's it, if it's not specifically mentioned, any violation 86B is a misdemeanor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Smith, so it's a misdemeanor. What's the fine? How much? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Fabian, misdemeanor would be the traditional misdemeanor, which would include up to, well, you're going to put me on the spot, uh, up to, up to I believe, a $3,000 fine in 90 days in jails, I believe, is a misdemeanor. But more than likely, it'll be put on some type of bail schedule through the, uh, through the court system, and it would probably be 100 bucks or something to that effect. It would be pretty much uh, in line with other violations of this type and scope. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Smith, um, tell me how a, uh, so a boat is being operated by someone that doesn't own it and how that plays out and then second, who gets the ticket for that? Um, and then uh, the second question I would have is a resort owns multiple boats as you're very familiar with and one of them doesn't have a sticker on it and a guest has rented the boat and under bare boat charter laws, they then are the captain, essentially, i.e. the owner. Who would be cited for, <coughs> for that? Mr. Chair, uh, to answer the first part of your question um, without the resort issue, um, it would be the person operating the boat would be responsible for having that decal on there. So it would be no different than if I borrowed your car and your tabs were expired and somebody stopped me, I would be responsible since I'm operating that car for having the entire expired tabs, just like it would be for a boat if somebody was oper if I was operating your boat and the boat tabs were expired. So the person operating it would be responsible for that. Um, it technically, that would also hold true for the person that's renting the watercraft from uh, a resort. Um, the person that's operating the boat is the captain of the boat. They're operating it. They would have they'd be responsible for having that title. But again. Our officers can use discretion in the field. They can give verbal warnings. They can, they can give written warnings, and they can, of course, issue citations. So. Well, speaking of discretion, we're going to call and represent Cornish. 
<laughs> former conservation officer, State of Minnesota. Steve, let's hear about some discretion. Well, Mr. Chair, remember, just for, first of all, a question, DNR enforcement, uh, Colonel, you, you guys didn't ask for this. You didn't come begging for this authority or dream up this aquatic invasive species extra authority on your own, did you? I mean, it came from some other division, didn't it? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Cornish, I, the division realizes the importance of aquatic invasive species and our role in that and making sure that we help uh, curb the spread of invasive species. Uh, this is, this bill here we have been working with the stakeholders on and, and the author on, so. Well, my point was is that the enforcement isn't looking for ways to, to hit somebody with a new ticket. But the other thing is, on, the, on Representative Fabian, the uh, decals are similar to the yearly stickers. I think they have the same language for the decals when you register your boat is that only one can be displayed, and the reason for that is we would have up to 10 stickers on a boat, and they wouldn't put them on top of each other. They would put them right beside, so they love to have a collection. It was actually illegal, but in 22 years as a conservation officer, I never wrote one ticket. I'd just say, would, could you go home and, and uh, sand those off and paint it or something and just have one sticker, and they would usually comply. So I don't know of anybody really, and it could happen. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but for somebody to write a pinch for an extra sticker, I almost 99% of the time I think it was a warning, so that's it. And then, Unless you want the dynamite story. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're, not doing beaver, we're not doing beaver dams today. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask you about that one inch of uncased, unzipped yeah, right. case on a firearm either. Okay. <laughs> Representative uh, Yuko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, question for the Lieutenant Colonel. I, I'm a little concerned about the fine part of this. Uh, what is the fine for not displaying a current boat sticker registration right now? Mr. Chair, Representative Uglum, it's a misdemeanor, um, but we have the ability to go through the, I think it's called the Conference of Judges, and then we can request that a, a, a violation of law have a, uh, basically a payable to it so a person doesn't have to go to court and right. um, I believe that the payable for failure to register your boat, I believe the base fine is $50, but then you have to add on law library fees and court fees and whatnot, and it gets up to over $100. Those are not commonly called the Rukavina fees. He would love those fees. <laughs> 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 the, Mr. Chair, well, would, would you foresee, and I just want to get this on the record, because, I mean, I don't want to see somebody paying $3,000 uh, for something like this. Uh, you would foresee that the fine structure in reality would be similar to not displaying a current boat registration, I'm assuming. Mr. Chair, Representative Eugle, absolutely. And we work with the Conference of Judges. They approve them. They, they take into consideration the wide scope, similar similar actions, as you just mentioned. So, yes, it would be very similar to that. It would not be. I just when I, I wanted to explain that what, what a misdemeanor right. can go all the way up to. So, yes. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Packard. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And in the same regard, uh, not the money so much, but... This is not a petty misdemeanor. This is a misdemeanor. And having a misdemeanor on your record is a serious offense to have on your record. You don't want a misdemeanor on your record. So that's why I have some real concerns about this bill, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, because these are misdemeanors. These are not petty misdemeanors. That's a whole different ballgame. And you don't want to have a misdemeanor on your record. So very, very serious. Uh, Representative McAmey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lieutenant Colonel, I'm a little confused. Um, the trailer sticker, we specifically, when we passed that last year, exempt that from any, uh, um, the violations in this section shall not result in a penalty but are punishable only by a warning. Um, and didn't you say that, Representative Hansen, you went, is that is that true? The current decal is not subject to any uh, petty misdemeanor or misdemeanor. Mr. Chair, Representative McNamara, I, I ho hopefully I, I didn't confuse you, I, but apparently I did. Um, no, I followed but, you. You were uh, talking about the boat license. Yes. And, but I think and Representative everything. Ulam, who asked the question, may have been referring to the decal. Maybe I missed it. Mr. Sorry, I Mr. Chair, Representative McNamara, so what I said earlier was that it, unless there's a penalty specifically authorized in the statute, which in this case with the trailer decal, there is a penalty specifically authorized. But under this language, there is no 
In this bill, there is no penalty provision specifically authorized, so it would default to the general misdemeanor in all of 86B. Misdemeanor. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm a little confused then. Representative Hanson, didn't you say you went through civil and they pulled the penalty? The civil penalty. Mr. Chair, Representative McNamara, we pulled the civil penalty, so. That were originally McNamara, those were the civil penalties that were prescribed in the bill. So what he did by with taking those out of the bill, it now reverts as a bill with no penalties at all, which means it reverts back to the regular penalty schedule that is an existing law already. Well, so by adopting this, I, unless Representative Hackbarth can explain it to me or Lieutenant Colonel Robin Smith, we've adopted this and there's already a set of, of uh, laws and penalties and fines and forfeitures that apply to a vast array of things that this would apply to as well. well. So we're not really cutting any new, are we not cutting any new ground? That's how I feel about it. Well, Mr. Chair, I would say we are cutting new ground and what I would strongly recommend in the repealer, Representative Hansen, that you consider repealing all of 86B.13 uh, except paragraph E, which would say violations of this section shall not result in a penalty but is punishable only by a warning. And I understand, I believe you're going to rules, and then at some point you're probably going to go to Representative Wagenius's committee where um, a money amendment would be in line. We had quite a discussion that this is a new and evolving thing. The department has said themselves this has changed like four times in the last four years. The poor voters, uh, where sure, the CO can use their discretion, but the reality, the normal, would be to end up with a misdemeanor on your record. and. All we got to do is send them to the ELS and, and get the sticker and, and get it taken care of. So I, I hope you'll consider that possibility. I think that would be a lot better if we would. Thank you. Representative Mr. Chair and Representative McNamara, um, you know, I'd like to get the bill moving today. I'm willing to work with folks as we go through this. Um, I don't want to make another trip back to civil law uh, or judiciary or any anywhere else. So, uh, but I you know, I'll be willing to talk with you about that, uh, but I would like to move the bill today um, and uh, continue that conversation. Okay, anyone to testify for or against the bill here in the audience? Yes, come forward, please. And Mr. Wagner, you had already signed up, so if you could go ahead and take a seat and maybe uh, represent Hanson, you can let the lady coming yeah. forward to have a seat as well. Mr. Chair, my name is Vern Wagner. I'm Vice President of Anglers for Habitat. And uh, committee members, and uh, we're here today to talk about some of our concerns with uh, this uh, bill. Um, I'd like to preface my remarks with saying that Anglers for Habitat is strongly in favor of creating a stable funding source for AIS. We're also strongly in favor of uh, educating anglers and boaters and out-of-state uh, folks uh, about the spread of AIS. We assumed that the, there, there is an existing surcharge right now when you register your boat. You, you register your boat for three years and, and you get a $3 surcharge. Well, that $3 is really insufficient. We really thought that the bill that we would be seeing this year would increase that surcharge. That way you could get um, the funding from uh, all of the eight, 850,000 registered voters. This bill uh, does uh, increase the funding. Um, however, something I learned here is the term the devil is in the detail details. So will this sticker, how will this sticker happen? How much will it cost to print the sticker? The sticker we had three years ago was over three hundred um, was over a hundred thousand dollars to get the sticker even to the point where it could be handed out and then it turned around and we didn't hand them out. So that money was wasted. So if you're going to implement this by January 2014, do we know, will we have the stickers? How much will it cost 
uh, to print the stickers. Will, will the stickers be everywhere where licenses are sold? Will they just be at the DMVs? If you buy a three-year, if you buy the three-year option, will there be different color stickers for each year at each of these locations? Or will it be a mail system? How much is it going to cost? How much DNR staff is going to be involved? I mean, we just can't hand the DNR this task of coordinating um, 850,000 stickers uh, with their existing staff. And I'm, and I'm surprised they're not responding to that issue. The other concerns we have is if these stickers are going to be printed off the electronic license system, can that even happen? Do we even know? Does, does, does the author of the bill actually understand those printers? Can it print a decal that permanently goes on the boat? Or is this a separate decal? Um, will, will we be able to track any of this? And that's a question I have. Is, is how many out-of-state boater stickers uh, do, we, do we know how many we end up selling? end up collecting a fee on. I mean, who, who's going to track this? Who's going to crunch these numbers? What kind of report is going to come back to this committee? That doesn't seem to be in here. Um, the vendor fee, the bill talks about every time the vendor collects his fee, they get a $1 vendor fee for doing it. Is this in addition to the $1 vendor fee? that they're already getting for selling the fishing license? Or is this going to be an additional $1? So will they get two bucks for it? And that's not clear um, in this. Um, uh, you, you've also talked about um, uh, the issue of education, how this will educate uh, the public. We already give. 1.4 million license holders, a booklet that has the most current laws, AIS laws in it. You couldn't highlight those AIS laws any better than the DNR currently does. So what is it about this sticker that is going to do what the booklet that they get already does? I mean, what what's going to make this uh, what kind of magic bean is this, uh, a rather than the book? So these are the types of questions that anglers for Habitat have. Uh, the last is, recently the state of Minnesota formed, the DNR formed a statewide AIS committee. Went through a long selection process. They picked some of the top AIS people in the state, brought them together. This particular bill has not been seen by that committee. The committee, in all fairness, the committee just formed. But they have not vetted this bill. They have approved the need for increased funding. They've approved education, and they've approved um, uh, doing something with the outstate voter. But they have not looked at this particular bill. Anglers for Habitat would like to see the author take this bill through that committee first before it gets to where it is today. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Wagner, about half your questions were finance questions and the other half were policy questions. So right now I'd like for if you would, uh, well, first off, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Wagner? There being none, Representative Hansen, could you come back up to the stand? Because there were a few policy issues that Mr. Wagner touched on that I think you were listening quite intently and uh, you might be able to address here at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, on the policy question of whether we need to take it to an advisory group, this bill was introduced on uh, March 11th and has been uh, before this committee before the break. Um, I've had numerous stakeholders contact me during the break and right after the committee meeting, uh, but not anglers for habitat. Um, the issue of bringing it to the, before a stakeholder group, um, 
I said before this meeting and uh, before when we met before that I'd be happy to work with people and you've seen the DE6 being created with multiple processes to get to a point where I believe we could get a bill to pass through this committee. Um, on the issues of issuing licenses, so and on the policy of what does a sticker do, what's the magic bean? Well, the sticker is, in a, is something where you have a, we have printed out books, uh, uh, Mr. Wagner is correct, but when you have the sticker, you're attesting that you've received the books. That's really the issue. You're attesting that you've, you've uh, got them. You know the information. So you have, a, you have the educational verification that you've attested in receiving that and that the decal uh, shows that, that you have knowledge. So in terms of education, you're showing you have knowledge. You show you have that, that you've received the information, the information changes, and that you're getting it. So who provides licenses? You have deputy registers that provide licenses. They have the ability to do the adhesive stickers at the deputy registrars. The ELS folks, many cases, do not. They would need uh, additional information. Online, uh, you can go online and get a license. And what we've provided for in this bill is a temporary uh, 30 days value. So you don't have to have that sticker if you do it online. And when you go online, you attest that you've received the, you have the information and you've read it. Much like when you go online right now, and, and verify that you have meet the terms and conditions of a website. When you're getting that license, you're, you're attesting that you've received it. This is nothing new. We have this all throughout e-commerce. So you are attesting that you've received it, you're showing that knowledge, and you're demonstrating that you've experienced that. For out-of-state licenses, I think the DNR testified, and I would testify, we do not know how many, but we do know that interstate transport of invasive species, both terrestrial and aquatic, is an issue. And that there's an opportunity there to inform folks of that. Now we've exempted border waters because of the challenge of enforcing that based on input from the DNR. So based on input from a variety of people, we've made the amendments that are here today. I, I commit, as I did with Representative McNamara, to continue working on this. But this is an issue where it is not only the funding it is the responsibility with the boat owner to have that knowledge and to attest that they have the knowledge that this is a this is an issue that affects our state this is an effect, an issue that affects public waters and so we want to try to prevent aquatic invasive species rather than continuing to react because the differences with aquatic invasive species compared to terrestrial it's hard to try to remove them if not impossible so prevention is our, is our option, and education and having some way of verifying that folks have received that information is why I've done, uh, drafted the bill on the way it has been. Uh, thank you, and welcome to the committee. Say your name and uh, who yes. you represent. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Biz Clark. That's B-I-Z, Biz Clark. And I am the president of Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations. The uh, Mincola represents approximately 44,000 lakeshore property owners. I'm also chairman of the Cook County um, Lake Association and uh, thereby represent some 1,100 lakeshore property owners. I come to this uh, hearing today with a different perspective. Uh, as Representative Hansen has just said, um, the important thing about this bill and anything that we do relative to invasive species has to do with the protection of our lakes, first and foremost. We spent a lot of time discussing decals, the cost, uh, what happens if you don't have one, um, what the fines, what the penalties are, how are we going to get one, uh, where are we going to put it, uh, and all of those kinds of things. But the most important thing is what we're trying to do with this legislation and previous legislation is to protect our lakes. Why do we want to do that? Um, I think one of the major things is because our lakes provide us directly and indirectly with millions of dollars in tourism revenue and local revenue. 
uh, is generated through all those uh, uh, boat sellers, renters, bait shops, all of those kinds of things have to do with angling in the state. Uh, and to do that, we want to have the best, the cleanest, the healthiest uh, lakes. And uh, as long as we don't do anything about the invasive species problem, we're going to lose that battle. Now, there are many people who think that we can't stop invasive species. Well, maybe we can't, but we, we can immediately. But we can slow down the process of infestation until science tells us how to better take care of the problem. And I think that will happen. In fact, they're looking at these issues at the university right now. Um, my organization, as I indicated, both of my organizations, as I indicated, support this bill. Um, the educational component that's been discussed is terribly important. And yes, we could put information about invasive species into our uh, hand, handouts that we give when you, buy, when you purchase your fishing license or boating license. But there's nothing wrong with telling people over and over again what our problems are and what we need to do about the problem of invasive species. Um, the thing that we would like to see happen is a fair amount of this money go toward uh, the process of processes of inspection and decontamination. We'd like to see the funds that uh, may be through this bill allocated to uh, the DNR spent on decontamination units. I think we have something like 23 now to take care of the entire state. I'm from Cook County. We've never seen one of these uh, uh, devices uh, that do the decontamination. We need to get more decontamination units around the state, and we need to make certain that people uh, are aware of them and they're used. Um, I think probably I have I've stated uh, the strongest points, points that I can make, except one other thing. Um, if I was a realtor and I was selling property on a lake that was infested, would I tell a potential buyer, would I tell that buyer that there's invasive species, that there's zebra mussels, uh, there's tiny water fleas, or any, would I tell, I don't think so. So I think we need to look at this from a potential property owner and an existing property owner's point of view. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you very questions? much. Questions? Coming down from Cook County, and uh, any questions? Uh, being none, uh, Representative McNamara. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. And, and I, I'm going to, I'd like to offer an oral amendment. Um, uh, Representative Hanson, I'm hoping I meant to try to get a chance to talk to you, but you were at the testifying table there. It would be, Representative Hanson, to keep this violation of this section shall not result in a penalty, but is a punishable only by a warning. It, it's my hope that that would, would maybe work for you. I, I think this really is an education with the ongoing changes over and over. Representative Hackbart, Representative Fabian both mentioned it. And Mr. Chair, I'm hopeful that we could do that and move this forward. If I don't know if Representative Hanson has some thoughts. It's the same as 86B.13, uh, uh, Section E. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Uh, Representative <laughs> McNamara, when were we going to put some teeth in it? Then? If your amendment did prevail, when would we put the teeth in? I mean, I, I can kind of get the idea of saying that it won't uh, uh, amount to a penalty before X amount of time as a grace period, but at some point, if you don't put some teeth in it, it's the same as having nothing at all in the sense that we don't have a record management keeping system, so somebody gets one at Lake of the Woods and someone gets one at Alexandria, but we don't know that it happened. Representative Fabian? Mr. Chair, well, Representative Fabian's got the right idea. I, I would be stealing it if I had said it. No, you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author and the committee. Um, maybe we could amend it so that it says on a first offense. Mr. Mr. Chair, and I, I've, uh, I anticipated you might be uh, trying to move this here, and I've thought both ways on um, doing, I think what the chair was saying is you go for a year of a transition with a warning, 
Um, but then I was also thinking what Representative Fabian was doing because what if you get a, a habitual problem? What if you get somebody who just doesn't want to listen? So you get the first offense. Um, and this is why I committed to you and will commit again to work on this because I think those are both valid issues. And rather than doing composition in committee, that we could work this out. I, I don't want to. I don't want to just have warnings going to someone who is just going to flout it. But I also agree we need to have the, you know, some type of transition period for people to to learn on it. But it does ultimately need to go into effect. And I think we've done that with other legislation of having a one-year period. Etc. And I testified in the previous committee that we have an implementation date here of January 1 to help with the educational items. So um, I think both issues are valid. Uh, but I'm a little cautious, and I know that that uh, the chair wants to adjourn on time, and we have another bill. So I I would like to move the bill out, and I would commit to continue to work. We are on going it. to move the bill out. <coughs> and I. Represent McNamara, Represent Fabian. I sincerely, I, I just see both sides here, and I want to try to figure out how to. So, Represent right McNamara, here. what is your wish? You know, Madam Chair. I, excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Chair. That was uncalled for the second Twice. time. The second time in an hour. I, I apologize. Um, I, I, I'm more than willing to work with Representative Hanson. The last time he told me this, he did exactly what he said, and it worked out fine. So. In the wishes of the committee, I'm fine with uh, just waiting for it to be. Representative Fabian and I, Representative Hackbart, are all going to see it again, I'm assuming. Representative Wagenius' committee, I really, this is a tough change. You're going to have people come from Iowa and North Dakota. They're not going to know. They deserve a break. Uh, the CO can send them to the Holiday Gas Station to get the thing. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, when we pass this bill, I'm going to make sure that Representative Hansen knows that I share your same sentiments. In fact, I think he, shared them as well, <laughs> trying to figure out exactly how to structure this, because it, seeming that it is, uh, frankly, I'm okay with uh, with a misdemeanor after X number of offenses. I mean, how long do you just keep going on and on and letting people offend things? I mean, at some point, you got to put the put the plow down. Representative uh, Hackbart. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, and I would like to work with Representative Hanson on this, too, and maybe we can work this all out, and uh, I don't like doing things like this on the fly, and I mentioned that to uh, Representative Fabian out in the hall, but... Um, I would like to work on it and straighten this out. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to oppose the bill. I don't like the bill in the first place. But uh, um, I, I, I was talking to Representative Cornish, and uh, if I think it would be simpler rather than doing first offense, all these different things, maybe just making a petty misdemeanor so it doesn't go on your record might be a, a solution to go with. All right. Any further questions from the uh, Representative Cornish? Uh, Mr. Chair, one thing we brought to check out with DNR enforcement in the interim is that the officer has to make the decision there, and I don't know if we're up to the point right now on the computer if we can tell if it's a second offense. And the getting ahead nod no, so we don't know at the time the ticket is issued if it's a second or third offense. So just making a petty misdemeanor seems like it would make more sense. And I'm hoping that in the near term, in the next year or so, that that problem is alleviated as well. <coughs> because that's been a long standing problem. Okay, uh, anyone else in the audience to testify for or against? There being none, uh, uh, Representative Hansen renews his amendment to pass House, House File 1442 as amended to the Rules Committee. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, now to the Purcell bill. Uh, the chair will, the Representative Purcell brings before us House File 1122. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative uh, Purcell, would you like to uh, uh, take care of your oral amendments? Uh, first off, you have the uh, the DE4 amendment. Oral. Yes, sir. Um, do the oral amendments first. Is that? Uh, oh, it's coming out here, right? Sorry about that. So yeah, I think we're passing out this DE4. 
All right, we'll do the oral amendments for first, and then we will adopt uh, the DE4 as amended. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so right now, uh, Representative Purcell moves the DE4 amendment. Now your oral amendments to the DE4. And, uh, Mr. Chair, members, <clears throat> the uh, oral amendment is uh, on uh, page two. I see folks still getting this here. I don't want to rush. It's a one word deletion. So, uh, uh, page two, line 2.3, uh, delete the word specific. All right. Ms. Taylor, do you have the amendment? Okay, so now. Uh, uh, Oh, okay. Sorry about that. They don't have the deep before yet. <clears throat> okay, so everyone has the DE for line two point two, I believe it is. Two point three. 2.3, delete the word specific. Ms. Taylor has the amendment. Are there questions on the amendment to the DE4, oral amendment to the DE4? There being none, all in favor of the oral amendment, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails now. Uh, Representative Purcell moves uh, House File 1122 to adopt the DE4 amendment as amended. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, now we have the bill before us, House File 1122 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Uh, very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to bring this bill before you. Um, I just just a, a, a few brief words here. Uh, uh, this uh, Clean Water Accountability Act, that uh, 11 Pop 11.22, uh, brought this forward because we've got some significant problems and. In uh, watershed restoration cleanups, and, and uh, in, in some instances, if not many, uh, we aren't uh, making the progress toward clean water that we need to, and uh, and we are we are spending taxpayer dollars here trying to do this. So we're uh, making an effort to uh, gain some efficiencies uh, as we move forward using these taxpayer dollars, particularly in this instance with the, the legacy funding. Uh, so a few of the uh, of the reasons that uh, uh, some of these plans are good plans, uh, uh, and uh, but they may just not have, uh, for instance, be clear enough about sources of pollution. They may not have the detail uh, on what can we, we can do to clean clean up these watersheds, timelines and milestones for achievement. And report back that we need as legislators uh, toward the progress. And we've been asking for this uh, for some time now in various venues. And uh, this is a, this bill is a continuation of that. Let's uh, let's uh, close in on these outcomes that we're looking for, and how do we uh, how do we gain those outcomes as efficiently as we can? And. Uh, there's uh, one example that I would offer to you, Mr. Chair and members, uh, and this this is uh, an example drawn out of the out of the current information that we have on cleanup plan, and it's for the Wild Rice River, which is over by my way, and I've uh, I've riced some of the lake beds along that river, uh, and that that uh, the the cleanup plan says that the water is cloudy from upland soil erosion and stream bank erosion. And, you know, that I don't want to be facetious here, but, you know, you could see a reflection from the clouds and you could determine the water was cloudy, but that's not real useful uh, when you're trying to reduce pollution, to have that kind of a, that kind of a, of a, of a cleanup plan with language like that. So. We're trying to bring some more uh, clarity to that and, and, as I said, efficiencies and uh, uh, working with, and you can see with this, with it, I can't quite match uh, Representative Hansen and a DE6, but this is a DE4, and, and uh, we've been working with a, with a lot of, of, uh, of uh, folks on this, and uh, 
really made some uh, made some some progress. So uh, with that, I'd I'd like to to uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Mr. Steve Morris, Executive Director of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership, and then and we'll uh, we'll walk through this bill. Mr. Morris, welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, would like to thank Representative Purcell for uh, taking on this mission because it ha does tend to get a little, uh, a little complicated, let's say that. Um, my name is Steve Morris, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership. We are the state's largest coalition of environmental and conservation groups with our compiled membership of some hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans across the state. Every year, our coalition pulls together and says, what are the you know, handful of issues that are top priorities for us as a community? And this is one of three legislative initiatives that we're promoting this year because we think it is very critical to laying the foundation for how we go about not only cleaning up, but also protecting our lakes, rivers, and streams here in the state of Minnesota. We have three handouts that uh, are being distributed. Um, one is a general overview. Um, one is a more specific uh, fact sheet that was developed by uh, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. And one is a little bit of polling information I'll just share with you briefly in my comments. Um, first of all, this is about providing more useful information, as Representative Purcell said, for cleaning up our lakes, rivers, and streams. And as importantly, it's about getting the most bang for our buck. It deals specifically with the legacy amendment dollars so that we have better outcomes and strive to meet the, the, the goals that the public had in mind when we passed the legacy amendment in 2008. Let me just, if I could, step back a minute and talk just about the overall process for how we're moving ahead for cleaning up our impaired waters, which is the technical name for waters that don't meet basic health standards. So as a result of the Legacy Act, which was passed in 2006, and then the Legacy Amendment, which was passed in 2008, which provided the money, we actually have in place a system that does comprehensive monitoring and assessment on a 10-year basis of all waters in the state. And that's, it's always more complicated than that, but it's overview level and then diving in deeper in some waters. But it's a 10-year rotation of monitoring and assessment. Those waters that are found not to meet basic standards then are called impaired, and the state is required under federal law to do a TMDL or what you could call a cleanup plan for that water. The federal bar is fairly low and we're spending about eight and a half million dollars a year uh, doing these cleanup plans and this is really what this addresses. It's this cleanup plan that lays the roadmap for how we're going to protect and restore our lakes, rivers and streams. After the plan is done, then we move into implementation and protection. And the key for it all is we all care about clean water, right? And so that roadmap, the plan, is really critical. And this is what this focuses on the plan. Without a good plan, without a roadmap that tells us where we're going, how fast we have to travel, um, what vehicle we need to get there, we can really, you can do whatever you want, and you can say you're making progress, but we don't know if we're going in the right direction or at the right speed that will ever get us there. <clears throat> Second point I'd like to make is that this is about Minnesota solutions for Minnesota waters. The federal government sets a fairly low bar that says you have to do a plan, figure out where the pollution's coming from, doesn't really put any teeth into any implementation or say you really have to do much in order to clean up the waters that are, cut, the, the pollution that's coming from non-point sources, which is other than industrial pipes, basically, or cities. Um, the goal that we have here in the state is to actually, through the Clean Water Legacy Act, restore our waters and get them so we can meet basic health standards. It's the 40% number that we use regularly about the waters that don't meet basic standards. It was the measure that was used during the Legacy Amendment campaign that the public really acted on when they enacted that campaign. Thirdly, this bill is very modest. It's non-regulatory. It doesn't do any, take any regulatory actions whatsoever. What it does is it provides the best available good information and put it on the table for everyone to see as we move forward with implementation. We've had multiple meetings with stakeholders and multiple meetings with the agency. And what's good is that the bill is now consistent with the next generation of these cleanup plans that they're developing, but they're not in statute. So what this bill would do is take what is called a wetland or a watershed restoration and protection strategy, and which is what the agency is starting to develop, which are more, more fleshed out cleanup plan, and put that into statute. 
So it provides the statutory direction and provides notice to the public and to the agency about what direction we want to go. And it responds to, concern, to the concerns of many individuals who supported the legacy amendment but are really concerned about if we're ever going to get there on the clean water side <laughs> because it sets in place a clear system with clear timelines, benchmarks, and uh, uh, check-ins. And, and before I get directly to the language, I did just want to call your attention to the polling. As many of you know, we do uh, at least annual polling for Minnesota Environmental Partnership. And one of the questions that we asked this year in our 500 sample poll that we do with two national firms, a Republican firm and a Democratic firm, try to get even balanced questions, we just asked about targeting. You know, should we be using the legacy dollars where they'll give us the most bang for the buck? And I guess it's not a surprise that people overwhelmingly said yes. And that's really what this bill is about, is how we can get the best information so we can take the limited resources we have and get the most bang for the buck. Mr. Chairman, those are the general comments, and I can touch kind of briefly on the sections of the bill, and if you want me to go into more detail or others, i be happy to do that. Let's go to questions and answer. Representative Cornyn. Well, Mr. Chair, members, um, uh, Mr. Morris, the first thing I would uh, just was going to critique one of the handouts is since uh, this is going to AG, Mr. Chair? Uh, rules. Rules? Okay, will it eventually go to AG? Uh, that will be a decision the Rules Committee makes. Okay, I would advise that because... You could have written your um, paper here a little softer. You start right out railing on farms, and since you're going to have to work with the agricultural community during this process, uh, the first thing it says is uh, caused by non-point resources uh, or sources, mainly agricultural operations that discharge sediment fertilizers, pesticides, and bacteria into our rivers. I mean, it make it look like they're going up with a dump truck and discharging things into the river, which isn't true. It just it could have been worded a little different than how you're going to work with them. I wouldn't start right off on a position paper blaming them for 86 percent of the trouble and a predetermined uh, a conclusion before you start off. And the other question, I guess, was already answered. Uh, hopefully, I, I would like to see this go to AG anyway and let the uh, farm community at least get some input into it. So, thank you. And Ms. Mr. Chairman, like, uh, just, and we have sat down with uh, representatives of the farm community, and they have some of the concerns about the lack of specificity that Representative Purcell was discussing, um, because it's really hard to respond when you just get test results that just say, gee, it's up in this watershed. And so um, we have had many discussions with the agricultural community. It is all in the PCA area of law, Representative Cornish, and I appreciate your comments about um, not wanting to set people too much on guard and, and um, uh, we'll take those to heart. Uh, the numbers that we cite in there are factual numbers from the PCA because it is, I think everyone recognizes the agricultural sector is a very big part of our problem. We're not proposing any regulation here. I, I think what we're trying to do is get good information on the table so together we can figure out what are the next steps that make sense. Oh, Mr. Chair, sure. I would just, like the PCA says sometimes about mining and things, I would probably question whether there were factual um, 86 percent on factual to coming from farms. I think that the, probably the agriculture community, the scientists would probably differ with that uh, percentage a little bit, but okay. um, hopefully the decisions that will come out of this will be good science and good fact and not just what we think is happening out there. But. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you have a question for you. No, with the, uh, the RAPS strategies, uh, here, the the uh, who's going to develop them? Or uh, let's just say you have a large farm that's uh, that is polluting the Minnesota River, uh, and and you're you're identified as a source and everything else. Is this individual going to be going to an engineering firm to develop this 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 these strategies and these containments and buffers and everything else? What's the process going to be? And second part of my question is. Is one year enough time for this to happen? Mm -hmm. Mark. And um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Uglum. 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 Sorry. Um, the last question first. Um, currently, the TMDLs are embodied in the actual wraps as the agency is developing them. So that's actually a, with a safety margin built in. They're doing them uh, uh, contemporaneously at the same time right now. And so. Um, it's a little bit of a safety factor, but we put that in there to make sure we, we do want to get the wraps done just in case they start to lag or something so that we tied them with the TMDLs. But currently they're faster than that. Um, on, your, on your other question, you seem to be asking about specific practices or specific projects on specific farms. And this is, this is um, all state policy. Um, 
and it will not get into prescribing practices on any individual farms. Okay. What it will do on a watershed level, and it's already a process that's underway, is say, you know, if the concern is um, uh, sediment, say, as an example, or whatever the, uh, the pollutant of concern is, um, it'll say, th this is where we are, this is where we need to be, these are the top practices that um, the state recommends, that they think makes sense, the state says makes sense, um, and then we want to get, have, we're asking the state to put all that together and say, how much of that would you have to do over how much time and how much would it cost to actually get us to our goal? So we don't just put these goals out there that are just you know, kind of theoretical. But the actual decisions about what practices to be done on what parcel are done in the implementation phase, which goes to Bowser and then working with local units of government. So it's not, we can't at the state level have them prescribing what's going to happen and individual parcels and who's going to do what. That's not the intention. But we do want them to look at a model and say, if you did this many things, we should theoretically meet this goal, but not select where go, what happens in each parcel or design practices. Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm wondering, are we, are we going to hear from MPCA just quick? I just was curious. We can. We have about 15 minutes uh, to go, and if we have to, we'll lay the bill over until tomorrow. Um, further questions? Representative Bugum, did you have a follow-up? No, Mr. Chair, that's fine. Thank you. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Morris, you said that you, meant, uh, <laughs> you mentioned in your testimony that you have um, met with the farm groups. Um, can you name the groups that you've met with for me, please? Morris. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Fabian, um, we've met uh, several times with uh, Farmers Union, um, at least once if not more with uh, Farm Bureau, have been the major, we've met with the general farm groups, had some more casual discussions with some of the commodity groups, um, but um, more, more, more uh, intensively with the general farm groups. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, you, there's a lot of discussion here right now about involvement of uh, watersheds and so forth. Um, what discussions have you had with the watersheds? Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman and Representative Fabian, um, casual discussions, and there are others who could maybe talk to that. Um, because we're not changing anything that the watersheds do, um, um, just talk to Mr. Bone outside. I, 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 um, He's aware of the bill, but it, it doesn't involve them directly in, in terms of changing what they do on the ground. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, then how does it affect? I mean, you've been mentioning them. How, do, how does it affect them? Well, Morris. Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Fabian, um, it doesn't affect their authorities or jurisdiction or decision making, but their, their authority. But hopefully what it will do is give them better information to better target restoration and protection. It's not just cleanup, it's also protection, protecting um, resources that are threatened. Um, but it'll give them better information and that we can better target the public dollars that we use for restoration and protection. But it doesn't change their authorities, if you will. It gives them better information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Morris, is there going to be a cost that you anticipate to uh, watersheds and LGUs? Um, we do not anticipate a, a, an additional cost to local units of government. There's no new burden for local units of government. There is a fiscal note that is in process, but it was on an earlier draft that we, they were, you know, there's oftentimes a little difference of interpretation, and so we've clarified the language that has eliminated um, most, if not all, of the costs, so we'll get a renewed fiscal note before uh, when it goes to the uh, fiscal committee or finance committee. Uh, Representative Hansen. Representative, Mr. Cadelco, would you like to come down? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a question for Mr. Morris. Um, so, uh, Mr. Morris, I'm trying to uh, reconcile. I understand you're, you're uh, content with the status quo. I, you signed a letter supporting the Clean Water Council's recommendations uh, uh, that have been developed under the existing authority. So, you know, we're special interests by statute get together and divide up the pie, and they've done that for the last four years. So um, how are we to reconcile your support for the status quo with wanting this change now? Um, Morris. Mr. Chairman, Representative Hansen, are you referring to the Clean Water Council or the Heritage Council, or which funds are you referring to? Um, Mr. Chair, I, I see your name on uh, the clean, uh, supporting uh, the recommendations of the Clean Water Council. Right. So. And, um, um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hansen, 
Um, those stakeholders, as you know, that, that Clean Water Council has an awful lot of representation of local government. And those not just citizen stakeholders, but local government. And you also see in that letter there are some significant um, concerns expressed about some of the issue, particularly as it relates to the legacy money and substitution of the legacy money in, the, in that process. Um, but we still think it's very important overall if we have councils that are making recommendations that we give them um, all due consideration and wait. And so we would definitely like to see the, these programs be more outcome oriented, get us to clean water, have clear paths, and we don't think that's something that's going to happen overnight. This is the third biennium of legacy appropriations. Um, so we're continuing to work on that. We think that's part of this, and um, we're open to working on that and improving the, the appropriations process also. So what I heard is that the responsibility of the legislature is to rubber stamp citizen council's uh, recommendations and, um, and then come in with a bunch more procedure to try to fix up to make something work. Mr. Morris. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanson, I would never say the legislature should rubber stamp. Um, um, I do think it's important that we give due consideration and serious consideration to the process that is in place. Um, um, we have our own, as I say in the letter, we have our own concerns about some of the recommendations, but we think they are largely, in, I can't remember the exact language, but we think they're largely on the right track. But we need to do a better job of holding people accountable um, for how the money's spent. Mr. Chair, I, I, I hear that as our responsibilities to rubber stamp. Uh, you know, it, we've been through this now for five years, and you're coming with uh, changes relating to watersheds, but the Constitution also says we're supposed to be protecting groundwater and drinking water. And um, I think you're silent on mm -hmm. that issue. Mm -hmm. And we've had all kinds of testimony that those councils never heard here in the public, out in the open, in the public process through the legislature. And so, you know, what's happened is each year we go through this, people say, well, we need to respect the council's recommendations and then we'll work with them to try to get them to agree. But the tail's wagging the dog. And as long as the special interests control the tail, they want to control the dog. <coughs> And here we are again, we're going to go more process. Ultimately, where we've got to be on clean water is we're going to have to look at a stream that's muddy or contaminated, and it's going to be clean. Mm -hmm. Will this do that? I, I don't think so. Well, Mr. Chairman, Representative Hansen, um, this moves us in that direction, we think, in a meaningful way because it does give us a total look based on, and this is aimed at PCA, it's PCA authority, based on their analysis of what it will take and what we're doing and what the mileposts are to get to that clean stream. And we think that's, we think that's critically important. On the groundwater issue, you're right, this bill does not address that. It doesn't preclude that. It's just not what this bill is addressing. This is really addressing, it's addressing non-point source um, and allocation of those funds for non-point protection. It's not all funds in the legacy fund, or the clean water fund, it's the non-point source. One final thing, Mr. Chairman. But the Clean Water Council doesn't make recommendations on groundwater. They've been making it on surface water. So who would? Mm -hmm. The legislature would, and they would then have to make changes. We have someone here from PCA. If they'd like to come up, and I think Representative Fabian, you may have had a question, or someone had a question from the, uh, of the PCA. Uh, Mr. Kadelka, you've changed, so you'll have to introduce yourself and, and tell us who you are. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Galen Reitz. I'm the director of the Watershed Division at uh, the Pollution Control Agency. Welcome. Uh, questions? Director McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Um, okay. Director Reitz, is this your proposal? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is not our proposal. Uh, this does reflect closely what we've been in the process of developing over the last four years. In 2006, when the Clean Water Legacy Act was passed, uh, it identified how the state should approach doing total maximum daily loads. But it also added a couple of new features in that 
we needed to assess the waters of the state and get through development of those TMDLs within 10 years. Plus it also added the factor that not only were we to consider the impaired waters of the state, but we were also to be able to address the unimpaired waters. 40% have been identified as impaired of those we've assessed, about 60% are unimpaired. And the Legacy Act said look at both and, and develop plans for both addressing the impairments and protecting those waters not yet impaired. So we essentially had to step back and say we need to look at a new process beyond just the, the federal requirements for TMDLs and develop something new and that's where we came to developing these things that we call watershed restoration protection strategies in that we're focusing in on the 81 major watersheds around the state as kind of the, the scale uh, that we're focusing in on developing plans for each of those major 81 uh, watersheds for both the impairments and, and protecting waters in those areas. So that's, that's how we came to it. Uh, there was nothing in law related to this. We've had dialogue uh, with the groups interested in this and the authors and uh, so uh, through a lot of discussion uh, this bill comes comes close to what uh, we've been working on over the past years. Uh, very good, Mac. Thank you. That answered my question for PCA. And I'm wondering, Mr. Chair, if we could just hear, is that the same with Bowser? Is this a Bowser initiative? Um, and do they? It's not their initiative. I see them nodding. Do they support this? Can I come up for a moment, please. Yes. Mr. Jasky, welcome. Good afternoon, John Jasky, Director of Board of Water and Soil Resources. Um, we've been working with the author and uh, the advocates for the bill over the last, I don't know how many weeks now it's been. I think it's been probably at least three weeks, it seems like. Um, it's uh, getting better each time. That's a good sign. It is not an agency bill, um, but we're working with them to try and make it a, a good bill. Where's that, Fabian? Oh. Mr. Chair, just real quickly then, uh, Director Jasky, it's got a ways to go yet based on what you're saying? Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, Representative McNamara, you know, I, I would think so, uh, particularly the last uh, item. You know, we are planning a meeting tomorrow to talk about that, that one thing in particular. There may be some other things that will also be in discussion. But uh, uh, so, yes, I think speaking to that Section 4 in particular, there is more work to do on that to make it, make it workable. Perfect, Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Jasky, uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, to, you know, when you identify uh, non-point sources of pollution and you don't have to have a NPDES permit, um, can you give me some examples of what that would be? Mr. Jasky. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Fabian, perhaps others could do better than I. Um, my recollection on the permits are that if you're a municipality that's subject to an MS4 requirements, you have to get a permit. If you're doing a project that uh, impacts an acre or more of, uh, of disturbance on the soil, I think you have to get a construction site permit. So there's, and there's also industrial permits, all of which in some way, shape, or form fall under the NPEDS permit, but I would ask the PCA personnel to speak to that explicitly. That's their responsibility. Okay, the uh, bill is laid over. We'll take up the bill the first thing uh, tomorrow, 4 o'clock. So members, save your uh, information for tomorrow, a continuation of the hearing. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.